Alex, it's nice to meet you. Hey, you too. Thanks, Desiree. Oh, so uh, I'm Desiree. I'm known as Desbot at the Nerd Element. And it's here speaking with Alex Pritz, who is the director of the new documentary, The Territory. Um, how did you get drawn into this project? What, what drew you to this conflict? Uh, I was initially drawn to Nadinia, the activist at the center of the film, and her life, uh, her work, her her spirit, and the fire with which she spoke about, um, you know, her work defending the forest and helping protect Indigenous lives, and you know, she was doing all of this really courageous work against the backdrop of. Uh, a part of the Amazon that is really conservative, um, does not support environmental messages, uh, heavily drawn towards agribusiness, and it can be really violent for, for activists and people doing her work. And here she was, this unabashed, unafraid 60-year-old uh, woman standing up to these powers that be. And so I just reached out to her and said, look, I, I'm really inspired by what you have to say. And then as the elections in Brazil, the presidential elections in 2018 began to sort of heat up, we saw this really disturbing rhetoric coming out of some of the campaigns. Uh, I said, hey, Nadinia, how would you feel if I, if I came to Brazil and uh, met with you and discussed the possibility of making a film about your work? And she said, yeah, let's, let's do it. And so I just started kind of tugging at the thread and, and one thing led to another. Nadinia introduced me to several other people and suddenly we had a film on our hands. Um, could you explain to the audiences that have yet to see this film, what is the central conflict of the territory? Yeah, the central conflict of the territory is uh, a conflict that's emblematic of the situation across the rest of Brazil, but it really focuses on one indigenous community, uh, the Uruwau people who are defending their homeland, a protected indigenous territory, that's 6,000 square miles, massive area of, of old growth rainforest. And they're defending it against an onslaught of uh, illegal settlers and invaders who seek to colonize that territory and turn it into private property for farms and cattle ranches. Um, and so it's an old story, you know, it's a story that's been going on since the beginning of, of the Brazilian uh, colonial process, but it's a story that's gotten a lot worse under um, some recent political changes in Brazil. All right. So in, in the beginning of the film, we do see that uh, you know, when Bolsonaro is elected, that it seems to embolden what you call the invaders, the, the illegal settlers to go in and just start clear cutting. And they burn um, spoilers. They burn a lot of the rainforest. Um, and one of the things that really struck me was the part about the association. So he, uh, Singh Sergio, does not see any of the indigenous people, so he doesn't even know if they're there. And that sort of seems like an excuse for him to go in. So um, can you talk about how you included them, why you included them? Because you talked to invaders, um, I think one's Martins, and the association, the Rio Benito Association. Why did you also include their story in this? Yeah, the... Motivation to reach out specifically to Rio Benito came from Nadinia and Bitete, the indigenous leader and activist who we were following, who said, look, if you want to understand where this conflict is coming from, we're not the ones causing this violence and environmental destruction. Go talk to the people that are. Um, and if you want to, you know, try to understand something new, look at look at these people in their psyche, because that's what's really driving and fueling this conflict. Um, and I, you know, as a filmmaker and a storyteller, also found that to be a compelling way to structure the film because, you know, I don't think it it would accurately portray uh, what Nadine and Bitete are up against if we're, we're just hearing from them as well. And uh, so we, we reached out to these farmers and settlers and tried to understand why they were doing what they were doing. You know, I think Sergio saying that there are no Indigenous people there is uh, a bit of a you know, uh, he's, he's lying to himself in a way. I think he knows that they're there. Uh, he wishes they weren't and, and he's willing to kind of uh, will that into existence because he wants this land so badly that, that he's willing to ignore the lives of all these other people. And, and that's one of the things that I found most disturbing while I was watching this is that they're clear cutting and they're just setting fires. They're burning um, 
without thinking about what's there. And one of the things Nadine had talks about is the death of all the animals, you know, how many animals they've seen. And uh, one of the things you don't do is you don't show those dead bodies, but just the fact that we realize it, it's really a very striking image in your film. Um, do the settlers, the illegal settlers and the invaders, do they even understand that they're destroying their own ecosystem? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, Sergio at the end of the film says, you know, that he thinks people are going to the moon uh, to colonize another planet because we've already used up all the resources here on Earth. And that's a really cynical point of view, I think. But uh, it demonstrates that Sergio does have a, a bit of a, a broader understanding about what we're doing to the planet as a whole. Sergio understands climate change. I think most farmers understand climate change pretty well. They're living you know, out uh, in, in connection to the earth in a way. Um, and he laments the fact that climate change means that he needs, he sees that he needs to go get out uh, new land to be able to continue to do his work because uh, he needs so many fertilizer inputs to be able to keep farming the land he has um, that it, it would cost too much for him to be able to do that. And yeah, so it, it's an interesting conundrum where these settlers are very focused on them and theirs and, and getting their piece of private property. Um, but at the same time, by doing that and going out and colonizing new land and chopping down trees, they are really disturbing the ecosystem that their farming relies on. You know, the Uruwa land, contains within it the headwaters to all 17 major rivers in the state of Hondonia. Those are the rivers that irrigate the farms that Sergio and Martins have. So were they to have their way, um, you know, and to cut down all this forest, it would be really hard to farm. You know, those, those ecosystem services provided by the forest are uh, really hard to quantify, but far outweigh um, whatever the value of that land is as, as pasture. Oh, no, I want to shift the focus to the area Wow. Wow. Um, they do start filming themselves. They take over their own narrative in the middle of the picture about, um, did they come to you and ask you to provide them that opportunity to do their own filming? Did, was that their decision? How did that come about? And where did they get trained? So B. Tate, as this young 18-year-old leader of the Uruwa people, uh, brought technology into his community. Uh, that, was, that was part of his role and how he saw his role as this young leader. So he wrote grant applications to get drones. He brought drones in, uh, worked with a, another NGO to get training for those drones. And we were filming all of that, you know, thinking, wow, this is a, a really powerful thing. And how interesting that the tools that this young man sees uh, as, as a possible way forwards for his community are the same tools that we're using as filmmakers to try to document this story and you know help shed some light in a different way. And so when COVID happened and the community said, no more people are allowed in our territory, journalists, documentary filmmakers alike, um, it became a really natural response for us to talk to the community about whether they wanted to keep documenting this story themselves and whether that was a possible way to keep working through the pandemic, despite not being able to be there in person. Uh, and so Bitate said, yeah, send us better cameras, send us professional audio equipment, and we will shoot, we'll produce, we'll manage the footage uh, for these final chapters of our own story. And that, it was a, it felt like a really big risk at the time, you know, I, as a director, want to keep a lot of control over the image and the, the sound and, and how it's all portrayed and the, the aesthetic of the film. And so, it felt like I was making myself a little bit more vulnerable by kind of giving up some power and control over the story. But in the end, that's the best part of the whole film, I think, is, is being able to shift perspectives and see this conflict from their, uh, from their hands and through their eyes. I think one of the really fascinating things also about the film is watching Bitate's growth um, when he's at a very young age, 18 years old, he's made the leader of all the different uh, parts of the, the different tribes that make up the area Wawa. And he takes that control and he becomes more confident as you go along to the point where they're telling, you know, find out what shots the journalists want, make a list and we'll, we'll get them for them, which I thought yeah. was just amazing. Um, how dangerous is it? Because we see some scenes that 
look like they could be extremely dangerous, not just for Nadinha, but for uh, the area Wawa well when they go after these illegal in, um, invaders. So how dangerous is it out there? It's very dangerous for them. I mean, it's, uh, it's an active conflict. It's, it's almost a war in many ways. Um, and they're, they're risking their lives every time they go out and, and try to defend this forest. And they're doing it for themselves. They're doing it for uh, you know, the, the natural world. They're also doing it, uh, whether we appreciate it or not, for the health of the entire planet. Um, and, you know, that Amazon, Amazon rainforest filters 20% of the Earth's oxygen, 20% of our fresh water passes through um, those filtration systems. And so uh, without that work that they're doing to protect us from the worst of our own, you know, climate emissions, uh, it would be a sorry state of affairs. So I, I hope that the film can reframe um, the way that we think about the rainforest, not just as trees and animals, but as the people living there and the people doing this really difficult work of, of defending it for all of us. And you said it's uh, 6,000 square miles of territory. How many area well are left? There are uh, just under 200 people and their territory is two and a half times the size of the state of Delaware. So massive, massive area of rainforest, crucial uh, for the protection of the, the rest of the entire ecosystem. Um, what hope do you have for the forest, the future of the forest and its people um, once this picture gets out? You know, I hope this film can mobilize support for the Uruwau and, and other indigenous groups. Um, I'm hopeful when I think of, of Bitete, who just got into university, uh, he's going to go to the Federal University of Hondonia and study journalism. Um, and so these young indigenous storytellers, communicators that are out there trying to spread this message about uh, the urgency and, and the respect we need to have for our planet. Um, you know, that makes me really hopeful. I think the bigger question is whether we um, are, are ready to listen to that message and, and really accept it, internalize it and, and change our behaviors. Um, so what is the, the current status of, of the conflict in Redonia? Um, right now is a really tense moment. The elections are coming up in Brazil. Bolsonaro is re-up for election on October 2nd. Um, and so it's a really tense period where everything feels quite supercharged. Um, you know, it's, Brazil's a very divided country. Um, and you know, a contested election or, or any political uncertainty just gives cover for, you know, more violence to sort of go unnoticed or, or get swept into the dark. And so, you know, we're, we're all pretty concerned through the next six months about what's going to happen. Yeah. And, and you show in the picture, um, you know, the, the danger, not just to the area wow, wow, because of, um, I don't want to give too much away, but there is a death. Um, and, but the threats that Nadine gets, and how does she power through all that? I don't know. That woman is remarkable. She is a force of nature. There is something uh, internal to her character that is just remarkable. Um, she has given up so much to be able to do the work she does. She has sacrificed her own personal well-being. You know, she's a woman who loves uh, to be outdoors, who loves the, the freedom of, of waking up and listening to birds outside her window. She's given that up in a sense. So she has walls and barbed wire outside her windows now because the life of an activist is the life of somebody who's constantly under threat. She gets death threats, you know, every week. We're, we're really worried about her. Um, but she refuses to back down. She is um, somebody to, to listen to and, and look for, for sure. Um, did you encounter any danger while you were there, especially something that didn't make it into the final film? Um, you know, I think there was always the, the specter of violence, for sure. Um, and that became very real for all of us when Ari was killed, when he was murdered. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, I think it, it was always there as, as something that I, I knew I was being watched the whole time. I would get, you know, photos of myself sent to me from numbers I didn't recognize, the back of your head while you're eating lunch or whatever. Wow. Just this <laughs> constant fishbowl sense that you're being held up and examined and uh, analyzed and 
in a sense, it was good. I think that we were aware of this um, because it, it really put us on, on guard and made us really uh, concerned about what we were saying, how we were positioning ourselves, make sure we were never misrepresenting who we were, what we were doing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous place. Now, as a, a documentarian, um, how do you decide the way that you want to tell the story? So in this particular story, um, you let everyone tell their part, but we know there's somebody asking them questions because they're obviously answering questions. So why did you decide to keep your narration out of it? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I felt like I was, would have been a bit of a distraction. My, my personal person, you know, the, the individual character quirks of my personality or whatever felt irrelevant to the story itself. At the same time, we did want the fact that I'm white, I'm an American, I'm an outsider to this community to be something that is up, up for grabs, up for critique. You know, what am I choosing to notice with my camera as opposed to what Tangai, this indigenous cinematographer is choosing to notice with his camera. And that's a conversation we, we absolutely wanted to have. So we wanted the camera to be a character and to be a presence within the film. Um, but I didn't want me as Alex Pritz to be a distraction from these other really brave individuals who are risking far more than I ever have um, in defense of this land. Um, do you see yourself doing a, an update once, especially the elections occur in six months? Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot more stories coming out of the Amazon. Uh, one of the big focuses for us is supporting the Uru Wow as they continue to tell their own stories. So uh, we've got an impact campaign around the film. One of the big goals is building a multimedia and cultural center within the Uru Wow territory where they've got editing suites, a podcast, production studio, uh, exhibition space so that they can continue uh, to support their own storytelling. And so I hope, you know, the next feature film that, that we're talking about is, is one directed by B today or the Uru Wow. Did you, you did mention uh, Ari being murdered. Has there been any news about that? I know by the end of the film, they still didn't solve it. Well, they, they actually did arrest somebody who they suspect to have been the killer. And that happened after we wrapped production. Um, and so we're awaiting a trial, but uh, we hope that that can bring some measure of closure for everybody. Yeah, that was kind of a gut punch when you get to that part of the film, just so everyone knows. Uh, yeah, yeah. Spoilers can, beware. Yeah. How can the uh, global community help to prevent more destruction and to help the area wow, wow, uh, keep their territory and save the rest of the rainforest? You know, I think the first, the way that Bichate answers that question, which I really like, um, is, is less about how can we as outsiders, you know, help save these indigenous people or the forest, but first starting from a place of humility, recognizing that they are the ones doing the work of, of saving us um, in a sense. And, and so just reframing that a little bit, I think is an important first step. Um, beyond that, we have a website, the territoryimpact.com.org, either one works. Um, where you can go and learn more about the, the myriad campaigns that exist um, to help protect the Amazon rainforest, mostly led by indigenous people themselves. Um, you can also donate to Bitete and the Uru Wow and their surveillance operations. Um, lots of information on the territoryimpact.com. So I should say not how we can help, but how we can support. How we can support. Yeah, yeah, that's... You know, and I think the other thing is as American, I, I don't know if you're in Canada or the United States or Europe, United but um, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm American. I think it's important for us to think about our own relationship to the land here um, and the native people and the traditional people of, of these lands, because this is not a unique situation to Brazil. America, like Brazil, colonial state built on these ideas of manifest destiny of, of white entitlement to native land. And so, you know, I'd encourage people to look into the land back, land repatriation movements here in the United States as well. Yeah, I was actually acutely aware watching this that, you know, this is what happened in America, or you know, I should say United States, all those years ago that wound up where this is why I'm here now, because of yeah. like that that happened back then. Um, I don't know if you've seen that movie Prey, but that also kind of reminds you of colonial aspect of, um, of what we did to the Native Americans, um, even though it's a horror film. 
Uh, my last two questions are, when and where can our audience see the territory? Uh, August 19th, we are going to be in theaters across the United States. Tell your friends, tell your families. The more people come out on opening weekend, the more theaters are going to open it up. And, you know, it's a conversation we should all be having. So we're really excited that it's going to get this wide theatrical release, August 19th. And then my last question is when I ask everyone, which is, is there anything I didn't ask you that you'd like to tell our audiences? Um, you know, one of the things I, I get really excited about is the, the score and the sound design for the film. You know, it's, it's an important topic. It's an important topic for us all to be thinking about. But beyond that, I think just the, the storytelling and, and the sound design transport you fully into the Amazon rainforest. We mixed it in Atmos. Um, so fully immersive sound. Our composer traveled with us to Brazil and recorded the sounds of bows and arrows, the sounds of gates on farms clanging, sound of a tree cracking as it falls, and worked all of these, uh, you know, sounds instrumentally into the score in this way that I think really transports you in a way um, to the rainforest. Uh, and I, I hope people are able to see it in theaters for that reason. I was, I was going to say, um, I actually do get kind of nerdy about things like that. Like, tell me about your cinematography process. You know, I, I remember at Sundance, you had mentioned in a Q&A that you guys had put uh, microphones on the trees so you capture the sound of them when they fall. Yeah. So Katya, our composer, brought this special type of microphone called a contact mic um, that's not recording sound through the air, but through the vibrations of an object. And she put that on this old growth tree that these illegal loggers were about to cut. And you can hear it, you know, long before uh, it starts to really fall. There's this splintering that happens to all the little tree fibers inside. Uh, and it's this crescendo that ends with this really deep bass. And, and she used that in a couple different places in the score. You'd never know that it was a tree falling. But I think somehow subconsciously it, it helps you uh, feel what it is that's going on there. I, I was, when I watched it the second time, I remembered that fact and I was listening more I was yeah. listening differently and it, yeah. just, it was it, I keep saying things were fascinating but this whole film was fascinating um I really thank you for your time I really appreciate it I could talk to you for a long time because I'm a super nerd so I have like all these nerdy <laughs> questions but I'll I totally nerd out I love the yeah the tech tech side I know you have the uh other interviews today so I just wanted to say thank you so much um again August 19th in theaters and will it be on Nat Geo as well? Uh, it'll be on Disney Plus end of the year. Disney yeah. Plus end of the year. Great. Yeah. So this was our time with Alex Pritz. Thank you so much for uh, talking to us. Really appreciate it. And everyone needs to see this picture. It's extremely important and it's really, really good. So, Thank you, Desiree. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.